Hello and welcome to Vodcast 12.4. In this video, I will overview four processes that lift air. In our last podcast, we talked about the importance of adiabatic cooling for cloud formation. And for adiabatic cooling to occur, we need air to rise and expand. However, air will generally tend to resist vertical displacement. But that's where these four very important processes for lifting air come into play, because they can force air aloft, force it to adiabatically cool, and then force cloud formation. The first process for lifting air that I'd like to overview is orographic lifting. And orographic lifting occurs when elevated trains like mountain ranges act as barriers to air. Let's revisit a picture we looked at in a previous vodcast. To the left of this image, you see the Pacific Ocean, then you see California, and then you see the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And then on the other side of the Sierra Nevadas, which is a very imposing mountain range, is the Great Basin Desert. Now, the prevailing winds will come off the Pacific Ocean from the west, but once that air runs into the Sierra Nevada mountain range, it will be forced aloft. And as that air works its way up to higher altitudes as it follows the mountainside, it will cool adiabatically, and then clouds can form. In fact, you often see plenty of rainfall on the windward side of the mountain range. And in this image, that would be on the west side of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now, because most of the cloud formation and the precipitation will occur on the west side of the mountain range, the east side of the mountain range will see very dry air, and that's why we see the rain shadow desert where we see it. Even despite the fact that the Great Basin Desert isn't very far from the Pacific Ocean, it'll usually get dry air coming from the west because it's on the leeward side of the mountains. The next process I'd like to overview that lifts air is especially important to us here in the Midwest, and that's frontal wedging. It's very important to state, based on our geographic location, that orographic lifting doesn't really apply to us here in the Midwest, mainly because the prevailing winds come from the west and we're very, very far from the Rocky Mountains. But we do see a lot of rainfall, and that rainfall that we see is because of frontal wedging. I want to return to a picture that we looked at in the previous vodcast, and maybe you're getting the hint that this is an important picture that may or may not show up on a test or a quiz. Hot air balloons rise because the warm air inside the balloon is less dense than the surrounding air. And we see this very same density phenomenon in ice water. Ice, which is less dense than water, will float. Well, let's now apply that same concept to warm air and cold air. In a future vodcast, we're going to talk about warm fronts and cold fronts. But for the purposes of this conversation, a really effective way of forcing air aloft is to have cold air smash into warm air. Because cold air is more dense than warm air, the cold air will act as a barrier to the warm air, and you can almost imagine that warm air is crawling up the face of that cold air and getting forced aloft. Now, as I've already mentioned, we'll talk about fronts in a future vodcast, but some of the most powerful thunderstorms that occur, occur by this very mechanism. The third process that we'll consider for lifting air is convergence. And quite simply, convergence is when air flows together and then rises. One common thing that I hear from people that visit Florida after they return from their trip and I ask how it went is, oh, we had a great time, but there sure were a lot of afternoon thunderstorms. Well, there's a very specific scientific reason that occurs, and it's due to Florida's very unique geography. To the left side of the Florida Peninsula, you have the Gulf of Mexico, and to the right side of the Florida Peninsula, you have the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself when I explain this, but at midday, the land will be much, much warmer than the surface of the ocean and the surface of the Gulf. Now, because of how hot Florida's surface can get, you'll get a sea breeze coming from both sides of the Florida Peninsula. And when the winds coming from each side of the peninsula run into each other, the air has nowhere to go but upward. Now, this is a very good recipe for strong afternoon thunderstorms, because the air coming off the ocean and the Gulf will typically contain a lot of water vapor. And the uplift of air is intensified by the fact that there's usually intense solar heating of the land surface by the sun. And as a result, the Florida Peninsula experiences more afternoon thunderstorms than anywhere else in the United States. The last process for lifting air is localized convective lifting. And localized convective lifting is when unequal surface heating causes pockets of air, which we will call thermals, to rise because of their buoyancy. With solar energy beating down on the land all day, a very warm pocket of air can develop at the surface. And I like to stress once more that warmer air is less dense than cooler air. And with localized convective lifting, those thermals, those very warm pockets of air, can rise vertically, undergo adiabatic cooling, and form clouds. A term you may or may not be familiar with is buoyancy. And that rising thermal is buoyant compared to the surrounding air. And consequentially, its tendency is it wants to rise. Okay, that's the conclusion of this video podcast.
As a forewarning, you may see any one or more of the four images that we overviewed on quizzes and tests. Now that we know about adiabatic cooling and some of the processes that can force air aloft and atmospheric stability and instability, we can turn our attention to condensation and cloud formation and talk about some of the very specific cloud types that you see in the sky.